It has been nearly four years since the catastrophe that came to be known as the Darkening stripped magic from the world of Urida, severing the ties between mortal and god and killing hundreds of thousands of innocent creatures. Airborne monuments fell, underwater cities lost their air, and the silence of the gods lay thick across the land like a dense fog. Stranger still, the avatars, mouthpieces of each deity gifted with their own divine energy, seemed also to have vanished. The power vacuum they left behind was filled by a technology guild called the Bright World Company two years later when they discovered a new material, Sacrium, in their underdark minds. Sacrium possessed magical properties that could be refined to create a sort of replacement magic. For all history, magic had functioned when a creature gained some level of influence over the invisible strings of energy connecting all living things known as the weave. Sacrium was the inverse, a concentration of energy that could very briefly be converted into its own sort of micro-weave. The devices that made these conversions were dubbed ciphers, and with some timely investments by Sir Topham Sav, the wealthy owner of the Summit Banking Guild, they made it into the mainstream. Rather than carrying around the raw sacrium as powder, which proved to be somewhat volatile and dangerous, it was converted into a currency known as Wingle Digits. These coins, these wingle digits, could be used as payment or inserted into the ciphers to trigger the magic held within. Just as wingle digits began reaching mass adoption as the primary currency of the land, four unlikely creatures crossed paths. Owlin the Barbarian Artificer, Hello. Jebediah the Wizard, hey, Zothkug the Cleric, That's me, man. and Fox the Rogue, the one and only. each had their own reasons for adventuring. But they found common purpose when, through Zothkug, they received a vision from the lost avatars a warning that the darkening, far from a natural disaster, was manufactured. As they investigated, it became clear that the darkening was caused by a race of ancient creatures known as the Aboleths, immortal beings with infinite memories hell-bent on dethroning the gods and replacing them. The Bright World Company, the Summit Banking Guild, these were pawns in the larger schemes of the Aboleths. And the reason the avatars vanished was that these same Aboleths had imprisoned them. To fight back, the party formed the adventuring guild Four Guys Ventures and Vibes and dove into the secret lair of the Aboleths beneath the city of Tumbleweb. Unfortunately, they weren't strong enough to defeat these ancient monstrosities, and they barely escaped with their lives. Knowing what they were up against, and having tipped their hand with a premature attack, Four Guys Ventures and Vibes established two goals. Find the seven pieces of the legendary Rod of Seven Parts, and rescue the avatars who could show them how to use it to destroy the Aboleths once and for all. Setonia, avatar of the nature god Kotix, was the first they made contact with. She had managed to escape greatly weakened on her own, and hid herself away. Kay, avatar of hospitality god Kelnor, remains a mystery, lost on his party airship somewhere amongst the skies, we suppose. Du Bumblefoot, the avatar of the god of order Zanir, was trapped in the south. Laredith, avatar of the trade and innovation goddess Awara, was suspended in the Umbral Sea. Garlel, the avatar of the chaos god Gomteus, was imprisoned in the rubble of the floating library he once tended. Oh, yeah, Garlel. Uh, I think he was like the first avatar we saved? This is, this is a recap. You're supposed to tell them what happened. Oh, like how? Yes. Okay, well, uh, we hunted him down, dispatched the guards, saved him from certain destruction, you know, blah, 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 in the nick of time. That is not a recap. That That is a one cent. That is the heading of a resume. You run oh, okay. the company, four guys, but just tell them what happened. Okay, so if you want to know more. That's what we want. It all started, I think, like, what? We just entered the Dwarven lands? Uh, we yes, had spent Udril, like that country is called. Okay, in Udril, we arrived in Udril, and we had spent like nine months evading the authorities of Tumbleweb, trying to figure out what to do, let Jeb attune to the rod of intelligence. And on our first day there, we had a warm welcome from the local thieves. Of course, they stood no chance, and we had nearly wrapped it all up when uh, we were met by the local guards. And among them was no other than Makar. For most of us, it was first time meeting him, though not for Alan. Alan and Makar evidently went way back, but something was off about him. My suspicions were shortly confirmed when he killed a petty thief in cold blood. The poor guy was definitely annoyed and a little too eccentric for my tastes, but when we captured him, 
they got the stolen goods back and we were deciding on his punishment. Makar decided for us though, and I think we were all a little shook from the experience. Zoth especially so. Zoth started to question our choices and decisions we had made. It's true we had blood on our hands, but never unwarranted. We had some fights that I wish had ended differently, but never unneeded. I, I don't know, but cause Zoth to run off in the middle of the night and go figure himself out. Somewhere out there in the wilderness, I think he found a new path for himself. And when we had gone out looking for him, by the time we found him the next day, I think he had come to terms with what needed to be done. Actually, <laughs> we had found him standing over a construct with his chest ripped open and its mechanical heart in his hand and ready to push forward. Which was great timing, because due to a suspicious dirt folk, Alex Greenvale, claiming to be a sheriff hunting us for mostly false claims, we had to leave. We headed straight for the Fallen Tower, though. It was our most promising lead. And we did hit a bit of a wrinkle in the form of Rex and Sasha, who were paid to delay us. <laughs> a wrinkle? They dropped a cave on us, my guy. I... You know, cave dropping to my to pop it. I don't worry about it. Uh, though I guess you know, we did have to dig sand out of our pockets for days afterwards. But you know what? In the end, they weren't too successful. And I'd say they turned out to be good people. For people who tried to trap you in the desert. After that, the rest fairly simple. We got to the tower, which was mostly rubble and underground after it fell, and found a way in due to Alan's childhood memories of playing in the place with the car. Fought teams of organized and well-armed goons, and surprisingly, Zoth actually participated a lot in this fight more than he normally does. I think he really embraced this new path and had really shown that he was ready to fight. It was a side of Zoth I had never seen before. And by the time we dispatched them all, we had to deal with this like whole fire trap thing that Jeb was a real lifesaver when it came to that. And once we got to the bottom, we had found Garlyle, who was magically changed to some sort of death machine. I don't know, we were running out of time. Luckily, Alan was able to recognize the runes for what they were, and we were all able to disable them in the nick of time. And I think it's no exaggeration to say Garlo owes us his life. But rescuing them made it clear. The Abolus would not hesitate to kill the Avatars to keep, them to keep them from being freed. And we were running out of time for the others. But you know what Grandpa always said? If you don't stop and sharpen your claws, it's going to take twice as long. So with that all settled and Garlo safe, we took a breath to collect ourselves. Fox and I found an interface for a piece of the route of seven parts shaped like a pole with a dragon's head. And Fox found and ate a small candy on the floor, unaware that it belonged to Alan's childhood friend, Makar. In retrospect, may not have been a good idea, but it seemed fun in the moment. Alan. Now there's a natural born leader just waiting to happen. He and Zoth talked with Garlel for a while. Spoke about something called the Cataclysmic Ritual. A spell so powerful, the avatars had to break it and spread it across Urida. But that was a problem for future us. Right now, we needed to get Garlo somewhere safe, and that meant heading to Fladena, the City of Dragons. Before we left the tower, though, Alan found a letter addressed to Makar. Makar was in league with the Order of the Broken Scepter. On the road, Alan surprised me. He designed and built a small brass flying companion he named Brad. He didn't last long, but maybe that's poetic in some sense. Ah, Flodena. Jazzy nightlife and amazing pies. We took a breather at Clara's place and spun a yarn or two. Even brought some honor to Old Circle's name. At any rate, we had Garlel smuggled out of town by a super cool group of bards known as Black Song and narrowly evaded a group of private security goons led by none other than Sir Topham Sav himself. Not sure where to go next, we did what any party would do and dug up a dead guy. Zoth worked the most disturbing magic we'd ever seen and asked the self-proclaimed Jester King three questions. And that's where we learned that Makar was hiding something beneath the ruins we met him at. 
That's where we learned where the Rod of Wisdom was. Makar had constructed a labyrinth full of traps beneath the fort. The Verticulator broke, being the first in a series of similar accidents, but we made it. On the other end of the room of mirrors, we got split up. Fox found the hilt of a sword made of shadow. He called it Shadow Walker, and it was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <clears throat> um, actually, Fox found Shadow Walker in the Fallen uh, no, Tower where no, you didn't. Gar- no, no, he didn't. And no, he really uh, did. in the I room of mirrors, right here we got a taste of... No, we didn't. Dude, no, we didn't. In the- but in the room of mirrors, we got a taste of our own power, having to fight reflections of ourselves. It worked out in the end, because it always works out. But it was our closest scrape with death so far. And what did we get for our efforts? A note. A ding-dang blasted note telling us we were too late. On the surface, coming out of the emergency exit and escaping the flood of water rushing through the labyrinth, we had to make a decision. Rest or hunt Bakar. But you know what Grandpa always said? Rest is for the weary and that ain't us. So I took to the sky while we still had daylight. We found him. Just as the sun had set and everything was dusk and silhouettes, we sat positioned on opposing hills, waiting to see who would make the first move. Alan was sitting in the driver's seat of the cipher truck. He floored it in a dramatic game of chicken. And when it came to blows, everything ended up in the air. Literally. I'd cast reverse gravity to try and confuse our foe, but he was cunning. The only reason we walked away on top was our teamwork. Fox's jazzy tunes, and Owlin's unbreakable will. With strikes of lightning and fire in his eyes, he defeated Makar. Zoth healed him because we aren't murderers, but Makar wouldn't have it. With his final act, he caused an explosion that ended his own life. We tried to console Owlin at the loss of his friend, but Owlin just stood to his feet and said, It's okay. He was a coward. Us working together is what will bring magic back to this world and save everybody. Wow, guys, that was a total downer. Anyway, man, we're chilling in this cave, right? Our scout tipped us off about a tournament with a prize that could get us an audience with the king. We enter and guess who we run into? None other than our friend Elaine Mollusk. She decides to sponsor our team, and we dominate the competition like it's nothing. Fox and Jeb invest all of our money on us winning, and we walk away with a nice chunk of change for the company. Winning also got us on friendly terms with the Prince of Udril, and thus would help us get a meeting with the King. We get to the castle and are given our own section of rooms. I was trying to fill Alan in on some shady stuff I overheard, but he was too busy scheming. That night, we feast with the king and meet his top advisors, including Alex Greenvale. During dinner, Fox and the Jester put on a show, if you can call it that, but it might not have been the best timing for their antics. When we get back to our rooms, we find out that someone stole Jeb's boom thingy and his journal. The jester extorts us saying he has information, but we have to steal a joke book for him first. We find out the jester wants a joke book from a local doctor in exchange for info on Jeb's stuff. I don't know why a doctor's funnier than a jester, but I digress. Fox finally listens to me and decides to tell the truth and explain the situation to the doctor, who agrees to hand over the book. Meanwhile, Jeb has a heart-to-heart with the king. Jeb and the king have a moment, and we deal with some drama involving Alex Greenvale finding out we were getting dirt on her. We have to escape a hedge maze before they kill us. Once we make it out, we go to the king and show him everything Alex Greenvale had done. He drags her across the courtyard and hangs her on the spot for crimes against the nation. He's one tough king. After a high stress situation, we all take some time to attend to personal matters. Alan sends out our letters and reflects on his past relationships. Fox teaches some bullying kids a lesson and talks about his merfolk girlfriend. Jeb takes a walk and reflects on his daughter's death. I go back to the doctor and work some healing magic on his daughter. Jeb and Fox work on some magic stuff, and we all learn more about Jeb's history through this weird device we're calling televibing. 
Jeb writes to Holly, and we end our day with a nice, well-earned spa treatment. Well, we didn't know it then, but that spa day would be our last good day in many months. If you were to ask me where the cracks began to show in our plans, this would be where I would point you to. Zothkug attempted to attune to the Rod of Wisdom, but only partially succeeded. He approached its tests with less wisdom and more with the logic of solving riddles, which resulted in less than desirable outcomes. The final judgment of the Rod was given by his fellow party members, who had been absorbed into the Rod with Zoth. After observing his performance, although I wished it weren't the case, I objected to his attunement, which led the Rod to have adverse effects on Zoth in the following weeks. After the attunement was complete, I had no memory of Zoth's attunement tests or my objection to his performance. Following Zoth's attunement, we navigated onwards to the Umbral Sea, where we intended to save the Avatar in prison there and cause incomprehensible mayhem to the Abolist facilities. We infiltrated the fortress with the help of a crackshot bounty hunter named Savage, with whom we shared several mutual enemies. We divided our personnel, and Jeb quickly began sabotaging the hotlines and battery banks, powering the fortress's infrastructure, while the rest of us snuck down to the complex crystalline cavern below the sea. We won a dangerous combat engagement against Mavira, which cost Fox his leg, and we freed Andromeda the Silver Star, a moonstone dragon that, while obtuse at times, is friendly to our cause. However, we lost Jeb to the Aboliths, as he freed Laredith, the avatar of Awara, from her imprisonment. He was not killed, but he was captured in the murky depths of the sea. As the party regrouped without Jeb, we were divided on what to do next. I considered Jeb a lost cause. We had only barely escaped with our lives, and we could not afford to mount an immediate rescue operation. Fox insisted on turning around to save him. And he was right. But... He especially was in no shape to do so. I convinced him that we needed to recuperate and move on, so we retreated to the city of Gaim, where we reacquainted with Ya and met a new ally, Radford, and learned that they had turned four guys into a sort of anti-mob mob within the city. I am not so sure mob is the right descriptor. A more apt analogy would be a family unit, assisting the local ecosystem with the clearing of weeds. But regardless, it was wonderful to reconnect with my friends. I was so saddened to learn that my friend Jebediah had fallen behind. After our reunion, I introduced our remaining founders to Radford, a monk from far away who was spending some time with us waiting for a chance to meet Alan. Radford and Alan went together with Larodith to try and arrange a safe hiding place for her with the queen, but they had a very difficult time arranging the conversation. Eventually, they were able to persuade the queen to protect Laredith, but while waiting in line, Radford caught sight of some constructs from the Bright World Company here to scout our offices. He and Alan were able to defeat two of them, but two more made it to Fox and Zothkug. Fox chased his away, but Zothkug didn't make it. He died in the battle. Wait, I died, man? What? Shh, you're dead. It was devastating for all of us but Fox and Alan especially took it hard. They found a priestess of Oara and spent 10 days working with her on a strange machine with many hotlines and wingle digits to try and save him, but it didn't work. And it left them sadder than before. Fox seemed to just give up on the adventure altogether. He said he didn't care about rods or aboleths, he just wanted to find his friend Jeb and leave this all behind. So he hired a crew of rogues and set off to chase down his friend. I prefer demolition expert, but rogue is fine too, I I'm guess. I'm sorry, Gunner. I did not mean to misclassify you. It's all right. Just my life's work. Well, the Umbral Sea. I didn't get to blow it up, but we looked for a few clues. Ended up with some intel pointing us to the city of Stainless, but we needed to make a stop first. We had to crash the private security goons, Gala. As soon as we pulled up in our new wheels, I knew there was gonna be trouble. While stirring some soup, an old acquaintance of the party showed up and threw a wrench in our plan. She had to deliver a cake. Or something. It didn't even explode, so I don't know. 
We tried kidnapping the leader of the goons, but he wiggled away before we could get anything out of him. Fox got some sweet intel confirming what we learned before about what was up in Stainless. So finally, we got to Stainless. We found a warehouse that the goons were using to store some important prisoners. Fox and FP saved them while Bruiser and I waited around for a bit and blew it up. It was glorious. The prisoners we saved weren't Jeb, but they still helped us find him. They told us he was in Summit Tower with a group called The Vaults. Sounded like a demo target to me. Everything sounds like a demolition target to you. Anyway, we had to get some dirt on the vaults first. So we snuck into a clock tower where they stored some of their stuff. We got some stuff and didn't blow it up. So whatever, it was fine. Finally, we made it to Summit Tower. The ultimate challenge. The heist and explosion of the century. We snuck in, disguising ourselves as workers in the tower. Fox was security, the rest of us were maintenance. After some scouting from FP and some magical trickery from the baddies, we found everything we were looking for. Three pieces of the Rod of Seven Parts and Jeb. In our rushed escape plan, a few things went bad. FP asked me to blow up Jeb, so I did, along with the whole tower. That is true, it was my idea. And it was magnificent. Fox and Bruiser worked together to send Fox the entire way down the outside of the tower to revive Jeb with a new doohickey we got from HQ. It was certainly one of my finer moments, although Fox nearly wet himself during this stunt. Did not. The doohickey worked, and Jeb was back. We escaped with everything we came for, and more. We even managed to kill one of those nasty abolists in the explosion. My masterpiece. You call it a masterpiece. I call it 17 pages of notes ripped up and thrown in the trash without even being opened or read during the game. That is the exact same thing. We're saying the same thing. As the city of Stainless reels from a crime wave, the likes of which they'll hopefully never experience again, Gunner, we set the stage for season three of the Winged Badger Tavern. As Alan Woodrear collects a group of adventurers to help him rescue Du Bumblefoot, the avatar of Zanir. And cue the intro. Wait, 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 wait. Come on. Someone needs to explain my death. What happened, man? You died. Cue the bumper. Zanir. Gontos. Kotex. Awara. Long ago, the four ancients created a world in harmony. Then, everything changed when the chat emptied magic. Only Kelnor, master of good vibes, could stop them. But when the world needed him most, he vanished. Two years have passed, and four adventurers have discovered a conspiracy, a company selling magic. And although their roleplay is great, they have a lot of XP to earn before they're ready to save anyone. But I believe they can save the world. 